you know what it is? It's the growth mindset. So you, you wouldn't be able to get there unless you had that mindset. So, so the mindset doesn't go away once you get to where you thought you wanted to go. It's always that growth mindset, growth mindset. You know, so people... Welcome to The Path to Wealth, the show about well-being, fulfillment, and financial freedom. And I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. Welcome back to The Path to Wealth. I'm your host, Hannes Henschi. In each episode, we'll hear from successful people and experts who reveal their insights to their career and business success. Today, I'm pleased to welcome our guest, Christopher Stout, who has owned a general contracting business for almost two decades. He's the owner of Stout Homes Building Remodeling, providing stellar services to clients, especially in the Staten Island and New York City area. He's also in multifamily syndication and is now the principal at Stout Capital. Today, we will learn more about how his general contracting experience gives Chris an edge in evaluating his multifamily acquisitions. Thank you for joining us today, Chris. Yeah, thanks for having me, Hans. Really appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. In case you didn't notice, my last name is Stout, so I'm also German. Oh, well, I, yeah. which part of Germany are you from? I don't know. I'm not sure. It goes back too far. <laughs> cool. So what got you originally into real estate? Even so, it was general contracting. What, what was your original ambition? So, you know, when I was younger, I thought the goal was to own multifamily real estate solely by myself and just keep accumulating as quickly as possible, as much multifamily real estate as possible. So when we say multifamily real estate at the time, it was two, one or two, not really ones, two family houses in New York. So I would work as hard as I can to accumulate enough cash to buy a two family house in New York. And my goal was to just keep doing that. So close on a two family and I had a goal, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a goal at, um, uh, at one time by one house a year. Um, and each house acquired, required really a hundred to $125,000, um, to close. So just continuously do that. And so buy a house, great deal needed renovating and just keep doing that and fill it with two tenants, two tenants, two tenants. Um, and I hit about 10, two family house purchases. And I continued to grow a general contracting business at the same time, um, then growing that business into becoming a home building business. Um, and then with that, my interest was always to acquire multifamily by myself. And the goal was to, in order to pull money together to do that was to be a home builder. So buy land, build houses, make money, put it into multifamily. So just keep doing that. So the home building company started off as a renovation company and just continued to grow. Um, so the home building business is very capital intensive, kind of like the large multifamily business is capital intensive. You need a lot of money um, to buy big assets. So what did I do? The relationships that I put together over the years of being a, um, uh, a renovation company, when you renovate someone's house, you're in it with people. You you, you're in the thick of it, you're working on their houses, you're, you, you, you go deep with people and it's your opportunity to build a strong relationship with somebody or ruin a relationship with somebody. So w my number one yeah. thing was always customer service. So I ensured that, I ensured that the, the customer service was always second to none. So as time went by, I built a good relationship with a large amount of people. Um, so when I wanted to start building outside of my own business, because when you're building custom houses, you don't need an extensive amount of capital because the people, the customers are funding the projects as the projects go on. So when I wanted to um, start to inspect buildings, so just building, building houses and selling them, um, we needed a large amount of capital. And I wound up pulling that capital from the pool of customers that I used to work for. Because um, at the time, obviously, they knew that when you're done building someone's house, they know what you're about. They know if you're a good business person or a bad business person. So, um, so I leveraged those relationships 
And one day, one of my clients said, hey, this is great, but the money comes back too quickly, meaning the principal. So, because really, if the, yeah. once the principal comes back, you know, like, what do we do now? Like, well, we'll wait for the next project. Well, what do we do in between? Like, mm, I don't know, nothing. Like, yeah, dude, this, this is awesome, but I, I can't be thinking about my money this much. I need to put it away. And like, I have an idea. How about we come into your apartments? And I'm like, no, 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 that's for me. I don't, I bet that's for me. We, we don't, we don't share there. And I went home that day and I was like, oh, I think that might've been a mistake. So I started looking into the real estate syndication business and it kind of grew from there. Just put together one smaller apartment building in, in New York. Um, put just, just did a small partnership with a couple individuals, um, purchased a building and set it up like a real estate syn syndication fund. Um, and that's, that's it. We're off to the races. Um, completely switched to business model. All the capital that comes in goes into the multifamily. Um, still do some development here in New York. In New York, development is good, but the multifamily we're not fond of here in New York. Um, and I, I, before we before we jumped on, we were talking about how, why, and how New York isn't the best for multifamily, and how a lot of people outside of the New York market don't really understand it. A lot of people that might have grown up in an area that is landlord friendly and the idea that you are unable to contend with people who aren't paying you rent is foreign to a lot of people who live in other states that are landlord friendly. You know, it's kind of like, hey, if you steal from a grocery store, you're going to get arrested or, you know, you steal from somebody, you're, there's going to be legal consequences immediately. So for a lot of people, it kind of just goes hand in hand where, yeah, if you don't pay rent, sure, a little bit of time goes by and you're asked to leave. Um, where in New York, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, the city and the state will literally allow you to go completely out of business um, and no one has any remorse for the landlord here in New York. Um, so we will, we will kind of get into that uh, in New York, just for, for your, your listeners to know, if you were to start an eviction in New York, you're not getting your tenant out for the better part of eight months. Um, and there is no program to help a landlord. There's only programs to help tenants. And any program that's set up is set up solely to help tenants. So occasionally what will happen is you'll get to your six or seven month mark and the city will now pay all of that back rent to the landlord, maybe. But the problem is if that happens now that eviction is canceled, you're now stuck with a you're now stuck again with a tenant who will continually not pay. And you have to you have to start the whole process over again. Um, and and never in my career, and I've been doing this for fourteen years, I've never seen a tenant who went bad go good again. Ever. So the idea that, that New York will buy tenants back into apartments and then let you stick with them again. It's, it's a, and, and now you can't sell the property because you have a bad tenant in it. It's a brutal, brutal process in New York. If you want to be a landlord, you cannot operate in New York unless you have the means to operate for the super rich or the rich. I shouldn't say super rich, for the rich. If you could operate a building that the rents are 10, 12, 15, $20,000 a month, and you have a large amount of units in those buildings, so buildings in Manhattan and such, um, because these these individuals typically have a lot to lose. So, you know, you're able to chase assets, you're able to chase income in, in individuals like this, but if you're operating in the 2000 to $3,000 a month rent for individuals who make, you know, 7,500, 150,000, those people will just ignore letters forever and you could chase them and waste your money as much as you want. And you'll never get paid. So, um, you know, New York is a very difficult yeah. place, but on the development side, um, New York is a great place because the market is incredibly stable. So we're not, we shouldn't ever be stuck with a track of houses that we can't sell. 
that's what you just mentioned about the rents. Obviously, for some areas, uh, three thousand dollars is already on the upper end of the of the markets. You know, and in New York, I mean, especially in Manhattan, you know, the average rent is closer to like five thousand dollars, which for most markets is like unheard of. So obviously, the the income to live in those areas is also in average higher. But I think so much of the income, especially of the middle class or lower class, just go to, so goes to survival in New York City. And it makes for such a different animal of a market compared to other areas. So what was your primary intent moving out of that space dis despite all of the trouble that you went through? And you know now you own out of state after making that move. What what was your original um, maybe tip that got you out of state? So you know, you know what the craziest thing is, and it, I, I think this happens to a lot of New Yorkers. I left New York kicking and screaming. I held on for so long. And if I could tell my younger self something, I would have left significantly earlier. Um, I really, really live with the model of New York is the best. This is where we do business. New York City, you can't get a city like it. And And I was stuck so much on that idea that once I left the city and started, and I was actually forced out of the city, meaning um, someone pr brought me into a deal um, in Northern Alabama. We still have the deal, it's a great deal. Um, someone brought me in, I was like, no, I'm not interested. They're like, you should go down, take a ride. And I was like, you know what? All right, fine, I'll jump on a plane, I'll go take a look at it. And, um, I get off the plane and I see Lockheed Martin, Boeing, started seeing these really big names and I see a lot of industry and a lot of things moving. And I'm like, ah, oh, man, maybe this is a good idea. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna jump in the deal with you. And they kind of brought me in for my construction knowledge at the time um, and did a little bit, of, little bit of business for a short period of time. And I was like, wow, what a difference. Like we would have a phone, we would have a phone call with the property manager, and we would go through, you know. So we have the weekly phone calls and the monthly phone calls with the property managers, like we do now all the time. But at the time, um, we would have a weekly call with the property manager or a monthly, and we would say, "Hey, uh, apartment 101, uh, they haven't paid their rent this month. What do you want to do?" And like, and my New York head was like, "Start an eviction," because we know, like, we have to start like right now because we're gonna. This is going to take forever. So they're like, okay, yeah, that's fair enough. So the next call, which we were on monthlies by that time, we, we usually, when we buy a property, we start weekly calls for six months and then we start going to monthlies after six months. So um, uh, we were on, well, I'm sorry, we were on monthlies, monthlies at the time. The m next monthly call, um, they're like, oh, so they're out. I'm like, what do you mean they're out? How'd you get them out? You pay them? They're like, no. No, no, we just, you know, we went through and uh, they lost in court and uh, they're out. Like, hmm. With that phone call, I was like, and it, you know, the, the property's going well. It's generating a lot of cash flow and all this. It's remaining full. We, we have a battle for people that need apartments when one goes vacant. And I'm like, what the hell am I doing in New York? And just that simple push me out. Someone dragged me out of New York, brought me to another state, said, look at this, basically like, you know, taking a dog's head and showing him something, um, really put me in a position where I was like, you know what, I'm never buying in New York again. And, um, you know, the properties that are out of state for us have grown just as quickly, if not quicker, and have operated more smoothly than any property we've had in New York. Um, so, you know, the... The, the real strong part about New York is the stability and it has it, it has general like very it has relatively good appreciation um, and a good stable market so from like a development standpoint um, operating in the deep city so Manhattan Brooklyn um, you know the, the laws and, and and they have to be the Department of Buildings there and everything is very very like on top of you, like they will put you out of business if you're not doing the right thing. But there's a lot of safety concerns and everything in Manhattan. There's so many people around. If they didn't do that, I understand it and I'm with them. I get why they're so strong about it. Um, going into like the suburb markets like Staten Island, where I am, um, you know, it's it's it, it's it's where it should be and it's not impossible to do business. 
um, it's a good place to build houses because the market is so stable. So even if there's a dip in the market, we know we're still going to be able to exit the, exit the, uh, the job. But as far as multifamily, um, our operations outside of state have been excellent. Um, and we buy B, B, B plus assets. Um, I take that construction knowledge. I apply it to everything down south. Where in New York, we might have, I, I, I've definitely purchased some C, B minus, C plus assets. Um, I've noticed outside, out, outside of New York, I can't be competitive in those markets outside of New York. Um, I take my construction knowledge and I'll look at a C class asset. I know what it'll take to go, I know what it'll take to operate it and I know what it'll take to fix it. And inevitably what winds up happening is my construction budget will be, you know, call it $3 million. Uh, I know, I know com my competitors, their construction budget would be 2 million, 1 million because they're not seeing what I see. So whenever I apply my construction budget to a project and offer a price based upon what I know, um, our offer is never competitive in that market. So, hey. you know, it just, it, and inevitably what happens is people learn once they, uh, once they get into that. Yeah. And then eventually some of those, they might buy the project, you know, they get it awarded, but it doesn't make a winning deal if they actually have to carve out that 1 million extra somewhere to do improvements. And, and I've seen that happening before where people, you know, maybe didn't do the due diligence properly and they ended up replacing the roof, which wasn't part of the original business plan. And then the cash flows out the window. Oh, the roofs are the biggest thing. I'm multi for me. What shape is the parking lot in or what shape is the roof in? The roof is a killer. The roof will bankrupt the job. And I think yeah. too many people don't take that seriously enough. Yeah. The, the assets that we're buying, we're buying, um, we're working on the third deal right now out of three from the same family in North Carolina. Um, this asset is 9.2 million, 146 units. It's a steal. I really, really got a great deal on it. This and the two previous assets, a whole portfolio that the family had, <clears throat> the, the whole portfolio that the family had, um, they changed all of the roofs prior to ownership. And that was like a major buying factor for us. Just know we wouldn't get caught up in that. Yeah. I mean, the, the roof expense would be close to a million so bucks. Knowing what you know about general contracting, how do you evaluate the <laughs> vendors that you plan to work with? Because obviously you're not doing your own construction given that it's out of state. How do you usually go in those conversations. And I mean, obviously there, there's a saying, I'm not sure if that's the same in the US, but it, uh, it's the, the thief uh, knows the thief kind of, it's a German saying the deep I can't in deep. <laughs> so yeah. I'm sure the same is true for a contractor knows what a good contractor looks like. So what are the things we should look out for when we hire different kind of vendors? That's a great question. You know, I think, um, I think now, we're so blessed to have the technology that we do that, you know, in the past, I think it was very, people were very able to be hiding under capes. So, you know, say Joe, the roofer had a company, uh, ABC roofing, did a whole bunch of bad business. And then Joe went to go open up a new roofing company, XYZ roofing company. Um, you know, the, the where the, the, your history is so able to follow you now where, you know, I really appreciate that. Like uh, being someone who constantly is doing good business, I've gotten investors from them looking up my reviews as a general contractor and seeing all the positive business I've done. So I think now the, the using technology and using the Google reviews and the Yelp reviews and, 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 and using all of that to your advantage. What the, the, the trouble I see people go in is someone will come in for a price, say $10,000, $10,000, $11,000. Then a guy comes in for 6,000 and they're so attracted to it. They'll look up the reviews. They're like, nah, the reviews aren't so good, but he did say he could do it for six thousand dollars. 
that's the trouble that I see people get involved with. So the, 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 it's very rare that I hear someone that the guy had great reviews, his price was in line with everyone else's, and I got in trouble with him. It's usually, the reviews weren't great, but the price was really good, so I went for it and gave it a shot, and then it was a nightmare. So, you know, I think a lot of us that are in business, unless you're completely oblivious, whenever you get into trouble and you look back, you're like, I, I kind of had the feeling that was going to happen, but I didn't listen to my intuition. So if you're dealing with the larger names, um, if you're dealing with the larger name con contractors in the area, and those people have been in business for a long period of time, and they're attached to a a large amount of good reviews. You spoke to someone who's used them and they're like, yes, they're good. Um, usually when you get in trouble with people like that, it's usually you who is the trouble. So, you know, also you have to remember if you get involved with business with a contractor, and I've seen this so many times where people hire us and, you know, we're on the topic of roofs. If we say, hey, we're gonna replace this roof. And then we get started, they're like, oh, you said you were also going to replace this roof, trying to get over on us. So them trying to be the thief, um, you know, that would that would create a bad relationship between the two parties. But if, if as long as both people um, are interested in doing good business, you won't you shouldn't have too many problems and be nervous trying to get into this type of business hiring contractors. So good reviews and just know what you, what you both agree to do, just stick with that and everything should go fine. And we've had pretty good experiences hiring other contractors outside of state using just that practice. Yeah. Actually, I like one of the, the, the sayings that Warren Buffett keeps sharing, you know, it's you can't do good business with bad people. And I think it's the same anywhere. You know, it's like, find the reasonably well-intended people, you know, that want to do good business and just stick to what they promise, just as you stick to what you promise and things will get done. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Just follow the, you know, use, use your intuition to when you meet somebody and also follow the, follow the history and you'll, you'll find yourself in a better position than you think, you know, I haven't any trouble I've had with anybody. It's if I've used anybody that, maybe was flying under the radar, didn't have any, you know, you, you, you have to, I also think a very positive thing is you go with people who have something to lose. So you go with the people with the, with the online presence because they know that at any moment, they're kind of, how about this? I used to tell people, I'm trying to, I'm doing a good job for you, but I'm also doing a good job for me. And I think it's important to understand how that works. As a general contractor, if I'm working on your house, I want to do good for you, but I'm working extra hard to do good for me. Meaning I need this job to come out perfect and I need you to be happy. So it's actually a selfish thing that I need you to be happy because then I need you to go online, leave a good review, and I need you to go tell your friends that we did a great job. So I'm selfishly doing good work by you. And as long as you're finding people that are doing that, I think we're, we're, I think you'll be in a really good spot. Yeah. I always like to say that if you don't have raving fans, like if you, if you don't have a community that actually will, uh, put their name out to vouch for you, you know, you don't have anybody you don't have recommendations or referrals or testimonials, basically, like, you know, if people, That's right. people are not raving and you, you just have very average, like, okay, yeah, he did the job. Then you basically have nothing and you didn't gain anything beyond the immediate financial gain you made on the job, but you did, you're not building any goodwill. That's right. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. And I think this, <clears throat> the same is true when it comes to investors. If you don't leave your investors with like, wow, they really took care of us. The communication was spotless. You know, we, we always felt well informed. We always felt taken care of and the returns are either aligned or beyond what you originally promised. Um, then you, d you don't have repeat investors. So the same is true, whether it's in construction or, you know, whether it's in the food business or whether it's in, in with your investors, like you can't, you need to nurture those relationships into 
raving fans because that's the only way you will compound goodwill, which compounds faster than money. That's right. That's right. I like that saying. Goodwill compound faster than money. That's absolutely yeah. right. And yeah, so it's I think this is the the one big theme that keeps turning up. It's all about the relationships we we build and that sounds so funny, you know, because it's it's been like thrown around a lot, but it really comes down to building genuine relationships, whether it's with the vendors, the investors, or the parties involved in the deals. So how did you originally evaluate your partnerships? Like, for example, the one in, in Alabama where you were like jumping in, how did you evaluate um, if that's a partnership you want to be part of? You know, so let's see. That's a great question. Um, I, I've definitely gotten a lot more stricter um, since then. Um, I, mean, I was strict before it and I've got even stricter after it. So partnerships, I, I, I think I'm, I'm always on the belief that people are good people. So I always believe that everyone is usually trying to do the absolute best. And what I've learned as time goes on is um, in a partnership, especially with a large, say there's a, a bunch of partners involved, um, not everyone in the partnership, not everyone's goals are aligned. So I think what I've learned is, is you, you, you have to make sure that everyone's goals or future goals are aligned. And it's not that it's a bad thing. It's not, it's not a bad thing if people's goals aren't aligned just going into a partnership, it's very important. Um, meaning you and I could be friends if our goals aren't completely aligned. Um, you know, you could have really strong goals that um, you want to further, you know, a business, you know, a food business, say you want to be the biggest restaurateur, um, you know, in the Northeast, and I want to be the biggest land landowner in the Northeast, or the Southeast. Um, you know, so we could both have strong goals, but they're not completely aligned. So I think if our goals aren't aligned, they're, they're just as strong, but they're not aligned. You and I could be friends and we could have healthy conversation. But in a, as a partnership, they have to be aligned on a lot more tracks than just we're both looking to do a lot of really good business. So... Um, what I've learned is when you're getting involved with partnerships with people, your goals have to, you have to sit down and discuss your goals and everyone has to show um, proof that their goals are, they're interested in going in that direction. So, um, you, you know, I would consider myself a very good person to get into a partnership with real estate with because my goal is one directional. It is, we are doing big things in real estate and we're going in that direction. So, um, and, and usually what winds up happening is, is if I'm in a partnership that I have partners that may not feel the same exact way, my, my personality is, okay, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to take the rollover that you were supposed to do. I'm going to absorb it into my side. Everyone's going to make the same, same amount of money as we originally agreed upon. And just going forward, the next deal, we probably just won't work with you specifically. Um, and, and, and I'm okay taking on more work than it was originally agreed upon because I should have noticed in the beginning that the goals weren't aligned. Um, but also on the other side of it, you have to say, okay, so the people who, people who bring you into partnerships, um, you know, and it was something that you you really wanted to do. So say if someone would bring me into a restaurant business, and I use restaurant business because I make a goal that I'll never be in the restaurant business. I mean, I make a joke that I'll never be in the restaurant business. So if someone were to force me into the restaurant business, I wouldn't be the right partner. And I know that I wouldn't be able to pull my weight because my focus wouldn't be in it. So, um, uh, I, I know that if you bring me into a partnership in a, in, a, in, a, in a world that I love, so you bring me into a real estate partnership, but say you're not pulling as much as I'm pulling, I'm okay with it because you brought me into something that brought in my mind 
and I'm I'm okay paying for that if it makes if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, it, it, if you brought me into a situation where I might be doing more work than I was supposed to, but I learned a lot, that partnership was a great partnership as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah, and I think especially you know if 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 for example your partner would have never brought you into that deal out of state, you would have still be fighting uphill battle in New York City right now. Absolutely right. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Yeah. That uphill, uphill battle, never ending battle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a special, it's a special animal. New York, New York City is a, it's a special animal, but it's, it's also crazy. Yeah. It, it aligns a little bit with what I've seen in Germany. So my, my parents own real estate in Germany. We've had tenants okay. just like what you mentioned in New York. It was nearly impossible to evict them. And Eventually, they weren't paying the electricity bills and they weren't paying uh, neither the gas for the heating or anything. So it fell back on us as the landlords to pay for it. And we weren't even allowed to turn it off. It was like, yeah, you just have to keep paying for them because it's like the minimum standard of living should be with electricity and heat. And I'm like, well, but wow. they have money from the government to pay for it, but they're not transferring it to us and we're not allowed to shut it off despite us paying the bills. Mm. And, and those are those instances. That's even where worse like, than New York. This is, just, this is just insane that, you know, we're, we're bleeding every month for someone who's not willing to transfer the money that they already received from the government. We're just not getting the government's money straight to our account. It has to pass through their account first. And uh, that, that was also wow. one of those moments where I'm like, uh, more reasons why we invest out of state, you know, in the Sun Belt, because, mm -hmm. you know, you, you just can't do that. And that's, that's kind of what you said earlier. That's like actively stealing from someone. Every month, they're taking it out oh, of yeah. our pocket and putting it in their pocket. But it's considered normal, which, which kind of blows my mind at times. Yes, yeah. It's, it, it, the, the idea that for some reason this one industry is exempt from all natural laws. Natural law being obviously you can't kill, steal, rob, you know, just like the, we're not talking about made up laws that you know, like, man, eh, those laws don't really make sense. No, we're talking about stealing. How, 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 for some reason in this one industry, it's just not considered stealing. It's, it's an unbelievable thing, but but you know, the great thing I always say, like, so the great thing about the United States and, and it bothers me when people don't talk nicely about this country who live here, you know, so whatever the politics may be, or they'll, oh, America's going, you know, America's going in the garbage and you just hear all this stuff and you're like, no, you, New York and states like New York and California who were very... Uh, democratic, and then you'll have states that are super Republican. That's a blessing. It it allows you to shift and maneuver within the same country and actually go where you believe the laws are correct. Because there there would be there are people who believe that the way that business is done in New York and the laws are operated in New York is correct, and that's their belief, and that's great, and that's why it's there, and they could go there. Um, you know, for me, I stay in New York and New Jersey for family. Um, and, and being in the United States, I could live here and I could invest elsewhere in states that I believe operate their laws in the manner that I'd like them to operate. And if I re if it really bothered me, I would be able to get up and move and I would go and live in those states. Um, and I don't, you know, in New York, in the uh, United States, you don't have to ask anyone's permission. I could... I could pack up where I live right now, drive to any state that I want to live in, and that's my residence now. I don't have to ask permission. I don't have to fill out any applications. I just go. So, you know, I, I really love the point in the United States that the local laws are different everywhere, and you could go wherever you want and live those laws. Yeah. That was actually something very interesting for me to learn over the last decade, kind of being an immigrant to the United States, to see how many of the people that were born there didn't see the potential. I'm like, there's literally people trying to 
come here and they will risk their life in the process of coming here because of the opportunity at hand. But for whatever reason, you were born here and you don't see that? Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, it, it's you know, I, I always think it's, um, it's like, what's the term? Uh, built, born with a silver spoon in your mouth. So, yeah. you know, so I, I had a friend who just, uh, um, who just brought his kids to Walt Disney World. And he said, uh, I came back, I'm like, how was it? He was like, it was terrible. My kids are so ungrateful. And I said, Do you, kids, by definition, are not to be great. They're not grateful people because whatever you present to them is normal. So, you know, when you're given, when you're given the culture of the United States and it's just given to you, you don't see how good it is unless you were to see the other side of it. So, you know, where does the gratefulness start? Should we expect our kids to be grateful for living inside of a building or a house? No, because it would be, it would be irresponsible. It would be, it would be, it, it, it would be, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it would be naive to think that they see it simple that they living in a, with a roof over their head. I, I mean, they're being grateful for a roof over their head because they were born and they were brought into this house or apartment. And this is all they, they're like, oh, this is how life is supposed to be. And like, no, we've never been homeless. So how could I appreciate having a home? I, it, it's just how life is supposed to be, right? So similar to like living in the United States is, you know, all you're doing is looking at the negative. And we just, we don't associate with ourselves with those kind of people. That's the, that's just what you're able to do. Yeah. The, the crazy thing is, and, uh, and I was, that's again, something from Warren Buffett that he, he was speaking about how the richest man on earth, when he was born, didn't have access to the majority of comfort and conveniences that we have. Like simple, it starts with entertainment on a TV. You know, he still had to go there if he wanted to see the football game or whatever it is. Uh, he, he wasn't mm -hmm. able to go to a dentist, you know, and get local anesthesia in the same way we do it today. And we just take it for granted. You know, he wasn't able to have the same kind of cars or air travel or go anywhere in the world within a, in a couple of hours because you can just fly there. Forget about a private plane, just simply the fact that you can fly there so that the average person mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. today basically lives better than the richest man alive a hundred years ago. And we, we forget about it so quickly because it's, as you said, you know, you just grow up in a house. Obviously, having a house is normal. So un, unless we learn that that might not be normal or the level of comfort and conveniences and entertainment and everything from medical achievements to, techno, to the technology we have at hand wasn't normal for the majority of human life on Earth, actually. It just wasn't. <laughs> it's all very yeah. recent. Yeah. But we, we take it as the new That's normal. Right. Like if I, if I look That's at right. the uh, kind of houses and cars we had as children, it's so crazy different than the kind of cars we have today in terms of all of everything that's in there and the, the level of comfort it provides. But it's just a new yeah. normal. Yeah, I think that just kind of goes back to, um, you know, I have to remind, I don't know if the same thing happens to you, but I constantly have to remind myself that the journey is where the enjoyment is. I have, I, I'm, I, let's see, how could I say this? I have more money than I thought I would have right now at this age. Um, you know, I don't like to ever say like, oh, I have so much. I have more money than I thought I would have at this age. Probably, probably a lot more. And I don't feel like that at all. I kind of still feel, broke's not the right word, but I still feel like I'm still trying to claw ahead. And, and yeah. you know, I look back and, and you're like, oh, so I'm 39 now, almost 40. Um, it, this is the part of my life that I was looking forward to. And if I don't take a step back and look at that and remember that, I will forget it and it will feel, I feel, 
I have the same feeling I did when I had $50,000 in my bank account, and that's all I had. I feel the same exact way, no different at all. If anything, I feel worse now, just because I know the uh, the potential. You know, the, the idea that right now, my assets under management is approaching 40 million, that the idea of that is just, comp it, it, Complete that the idea of that to Chris out ten years ago is completely bananas. Like, just completely impossible. Yeah. That'll never happen. So here now, and I can tell you that it feels exactly the same. You don't feel rich. You actually feel poorer because you you're now surrounded in the environment where you're like, hey, how much how much asset how many assets on the management do you have? Like, oh, two hundred million, five hundred million, a billion, and I'm like. Damn it! I'm not doing anything yet. But if you talk to some other people, you're like, they're like, you have 40 million under management. You know, and to them, it's like completely insane. So, you know, it. I think it'll always feel the same, and you have to always remember to enjoy the journey. That's where the fun lies. I think you. I think you're 100 percent right. There's actually a, a very well um, done study around that. I, I can't recall the title right now, but the magic number, and that was a couple of years ago, they probably need to adjust it based on inflation, everything that happened in the last five years, but it used to be $70,000. And the funny I thing is, that. I crossed that mark and I, the feelings kind of developed the way you said it, you know, uh, after that, I never felt richer, despite me mm -hmm. out earning what I've ever thought I would earn. And the interesting thing is, and you just put it in words, I, I, I couldn't really put it on it, but having the knowledge now on where I can take it actually at times makes me feel worse because just like you said, now I find myself in rooms where people own private chats because of their real estate business. And I'm like, so you tell me if I just do, if I push a little bit harder than maybe I'm doing right now, that's the possibility. And then obviously yeah. this is where we really need to be very contemplated and be like, Hey, what is my definition of success? Because otherwise it's so easy to get that chi shiny object syndrome. Like, wait, they, they're managing 500 million or a billion and they have this and this and that. And that's, that's where you have to be super, super dialed in on, you know, what success means for yourself. So yeah. Yeah. what, what yeah. does success mean to you? That's a difficult, that's a difficult one because, you know, I'm in the, exactly what you just said. I'm in the same mindset now of like, what does success mean? Um, you know, we could go, and I don't think this provides value to any viewers or listeners, really anyone else who hears it when I, when you say go the normal, like, oh, my wife and my kids. No. So my wife and I have a wonderful relationship. My kids are kids. They're all healthy. They're all going through their thing that they do when they go to school and, you know, the teenagers doing a teenage thing. And so all that is fine. So where I think I could provide value is um, uh, w what success looks like to me now is uh, let's just be honest with it. It's 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 in a material form because um, outside of the family, it's material, right? So you have everything that you, you need for your basic, um, you, you know, well-being and all that, and then pass that as material. So, you know, I, I think w my goal is a billion dollars assets under management and a private jet. That's it. So we do what we have to do to get to that point. And I'm, I, I think I'm going to laugh in 10 years when, when, what it, in a 10 year time span, when that period of time passes, wherever I might be in that period of time, hopefully was, I can't believe that's all I thought I was able to do. So that's, that, <laughs> you know, that's, that's where I am right now with it. <clears throat> yeah. So we'll see how that, yeah, you know we'll, that, we'll see how that changes as time goes on, those goes on. The crazy thing is I've literally stood next to people that just brought purchase like the biggest yacht that they thought of at times and when 
when it was actually custom made mm. and it just arrived and I saw them taking the first joy ride and a week later we were standing in the marina and the bigger one was moving in very nice very nice well made sparkling and I could see it in the eyes I'm like hmm maybe it's more like 150 foot you know and I'm just like well this really yeah. never ends <laughs> Like you it know, never once ends. Well, never. By the time, by the time you have that chat, you you might be thinking like, hmm, maybe I actually want a, a G six fifty because that can get me to Dubai without a yeah. stop in between. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that stop is really really inconvenient. So we have to go G six fifty. But you you know, that's just you know what it is. It's the growth mindset. So you you wouldn't be able to get there unless you had that mindset so so the mindset doesn't go away once you get to where you thought you wanted to go it's always that growth mindset growth mindset you know so people will see people like buffett trump like the big names like no if i had their money i would stop working and they're like no if you have that mindset you would just never get there you know it's such an ignorant thing to say if I had their money, I would stop working. It's, it's not about, it's not about that. It's not even, it's not about the money itself. It's about the game and the goal. It, you know, that's the people who say that are also probably huge sports fans and the, they'll continually watch games over and over and over. Why are you continually watching games? The same thing's going to happen. Um, but it's, it's just the mindset. It's a different wired brain that just makes you keep going. And it, it'll put you in a, in, a, in a state that's forever not satisfied. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing about Warren Buffett is I think he, he's a different kind of guy than many because he's so reflected. He never upgraded big time he still lives in the same house that i believe he bought in the 60s um mm -hmm. and, and he says it. that over and over again he he's like yeah more or less i'm i'm eating the the same food as most of you maybe my suits are slightly more expensive but you know uh, he, he never upgraded so in that sense i think he's enormously reflected because he always emphasized the value of doing what he wants to do when he wants with who he wants and that for him berkshire is is such a uh, such a fun endeavor to be on because he loves everybody he's working with and he tap dance to work you know every morning and he's just uh, really doing what he loves to do and he happens to live at a time where his skill set is highly rewarded yeah yeah so but yeah, it's, it, um, it sounds like he truly he he never chased uh the material impact on what what money could provide for him because he, he, he never got crazy around that. And now he's actually all about charity. So he's just going to give away hundreds of millions of uh, billions of dollars to charity. Yeah, I, I, I would add, I would like to add that to, to, to my level of success. I, I don't have billions of dollars to give away, but um, I really yet. do enjoy yet. But, <clears throat> I, I do enjoy that as well. I think the philanthropic side of it is is very cool. You know, we de we definitely do it on a smaller scale. Whenever we close a deal on a sales side, and you get the escrow refund check, we actually don't we don't account on, on my own personal deals with the investors. The escrow refund check is is accounted for when we have deals with investors the escrow where would be an escrow refund is accounted for in the closing cost because we we have it on the debit side of, of a purchase so then it's on the credit side of a sale um yep. but deals that I, ha I own entirely by myself um my escrow refund i i leave it out of the equation because i know it's coming but i leave it out of the equation um and i know that checks that check is coming in a couple weeks after closing I make a goal that that check is given away um, and I do it in, I don't really, I don't do it in, in, in like the formal charity giving way. What I like to do is I save up, I, I usually have a couple hundred, you know, maybe a thousand of it on me at any time. And 
uh, what I'll do is I'll give ridiculous tips to people who, if, if, if you're sitting in a restaurant, I'm like, man, that waitress was nice. Couple hundred buck tip, couple hundred buck tip. Bartender, 200 bucks walking away. So, and, and I try to walk, I try to put it down and walk away in a sense where I don't have an interaction with them. So, and, and sometimes, sometimes like selfishly, I'll like look from afar just to like absorb that, then like them seeing it and being like, oh my gosh. Um, that's the way, right now, that's the way that I like to give. I like to just over give to people who did a normal thing for me. Yeah. And, and then that can actually go a, a long way, given that I used to work full time in the restaurant industry. There are some individuals who really need that money, you know, and, and, and it, it, oh, yeah. it really makes a dent. And I, I'll give you a personal story of mine, a friend of mine, when she first came to the United States, she, she didn't know how to pay her rent at first. And because of someone mm -hmm. as generous as you, within two days working at a bar, she was able to cover her rent. And obviously that's a New York City thing, you know, uh, it's, it might be less likely to happen elsewhere, but it, it just blew her mind. And it also set her off to become a successful restaurateur on her own. But it, it, it was uh, in those moments when someone decided to, to reward her, you know, and so it, it, it can go a long way. So I have one, f one final question that I like to ask. Um, sure. What do you consider a life worth living or well lived? <sighs> what do I consider a life well lived? Um, you know, I could probably say the number one word is travel and freedom, a life led by freedom. So a lot of people, unless they're on this journey that you and I are on, um, the idea of freedom, it just doesn't make sense. The idea of freedom is a oh, one day I'll retire in my fifties or sixties and I'll then live free. And I think the bad part about that is, is no one really realizes how much money you need to be free. Um, so most people didn't have enough money while they were working. Retired life is typically less lucrative than working life. Um, for those who follow the typical, you know, W2, nine to five. So, so I encourage those to get out there and learn what this means. But a free life is you operate in such a manner that you're not locked down to any one spot or any one thing. So on the journey that you and I are on, it's a hard, hard journey. But, you know, the idea of, 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 of purchasing, accumulating and gathering. So purchasing real estate, accumulating real estate, gathering people together to purchase these assets and then performing at the same time, you could live a free life where you're able to kind of do and go where you want. Um, so it's actually, for me, my work is not what holds me in one place. It's more the kids and the stability of running a family. Um, but living a life that's free and filled with travel and broadening your mind um, to see other cultures, see how other people operate. There's so much to see out there um, and there's so much to do and, and Hans, you and I have seen the growth of what happens when you just start to scratch away at the iceberg. Um, you know, you, you start to stand back and see how much is possible. And I think that so many people, not to compare myself with other people, but so many people live inside of a bubble where they're like, I bought this house at 19 and I'm going to live here forever and I'm never going to sell it. You know, the idea that, and, and they're just going to hate on people who, are accomplishing all these things like they must be doing something wrong or you know all oh, they they've changed as time has gone on you know just live a life of surrounding yourself with like-minded people and and continuously chase new goals better goals um and focusing on 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 what's right for you and your family that's that's a, a life worth living for me nice nice 
Well, thanks so much for sharing. Chris, where can people connect with you? Where can they find out more about you or what you're up to next? Yeah, so um, the website was down for the holiday, but stoutcap.com, S-T-O-U-T-C-A-P, stoutcap.com. That's my uh, multifamily company. And stout underscore build on Instagram is where I put most of my content, stout build on Instagram. Um, would it, Hans, if you don't mind me asking, it, could, could you throw it at me, the, uh, your, your um, definition of a life worth living? And I guess we could end with that. Oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, um, for me, it's really about uh, making an impact. Like I'm already at a point in my life where I feel like I have more resources than I ever thought. And from now I want to see, you know, how many more people can I impact on my journey and, you know, really, and, and that's why this podcast is called the path to wealth, but you know, wealth, like well being too, because I think it's a well-rounded journey where it's not just about having the material comforts that we can buy with money, but also the freedom that allows us to contemplate on what life can be, you know? So it's, uh, yeah, I want to impact. First, I want to help people to gain financial freedom so that in return, they can also, uh, you know, sit still and reflect on what, what life means. And, and I, I believe that everybody that gains financial independence becomes a giver by default, because once you've taken care of yourself, you, you will eventually turn towards others. And, and that might take a lifetime to understand, but I think I, tr I truly believe that, that the majority of people, once you take care of yourself, you become a giver. So that's 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 what i consider life well lived or worth living uh, yeah. yeah our definitions were were pretty close yeah, can, yeah awesome chris well thank you so much yeah well freedom yeah is it's so essential for me and then every time i look at like oh man i i could just play it safe i get a w2 job but that's it And I'm like, no, I can just go out there and, and try to try to fight for freedom, you know, and worst case, I can always go back to what other people consider safety. And even, especially my German friends and community, I'm like, you're already German. It doesn't get a lot more safe than that. Like the worst case scenario of you living of social security in Germany is basically probably better life than six and a half billion people in the world have. It's just by your default safety net, but they still want to play it safe by only saving money, you know, not, not going out investing money because you know, you could lose your principal if you make a bad investment. So whenever I speak to them, I'm like, wow, your perspective is just like so hard ingrained in trying to have safety. They, they really live in this over safety mindset. And I'm like, I would much rather be in the trenches trying to get true freedom of time and space and whereabouts for myself than, you know, simply sitting there trying to collect a paycheck. Yeah. Very cool. All right, that was good. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for joining us at The Path to Wealth. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Check out our upcoming guests and be sure to share it with all your friends and family that want to take their life to the next level of wealth.